Good. Hi, Hi. Hillary. Hi. Hello, Hi. everyone. <laughs> Hello. Hi, everyone. Welcome, welcome to Grace Between Races. Uh, this is our 12th um, gathering. And um, I'm so happy to be here. It's been a little while, but um, here we are again, connecting together. And um, um, we are happy to have um, Chast Chastity Rodriguez here with us as our guest speaker. And um, yeah, I'm looking forward to hear what she brings to the table and to the circle. And uh, we'll take it from there. <laughs> as usual, I think it's very important for us. She went for it. I'm gonna light a, an incense, a frankincense here, and um, just clear the space a little bit. So I'm um, just bringing some energy, lightness. Mm -hmm. I love the smell of that. Yeah. So if we can close our eyes and just energy back to the present moment, and we're going to take some deep breaths. So we're going to breathe in for four, a count of four. Hold for a count of two and exhale for a count of four. We could do that a few times. Breathe in for a count of four. Hold for a count of two. And exhale for a count of four. And if we, if you'd like to put your hands on your heart to make that heart connection, that would be perfect if you wish. If not, do whatever feels comfortable for you. Continue breathing, deep breath four for four. Hold for two. And exhale for four. Again, one more time. Deep breath in. Hold for two. And exhale for four. And whenever you're ready, you can open back your eyes. Come back to the space. So um, I'm just going to read a little bit of uh, just the intention this time. We have the whole thing on the page of Race Between Races. So I'm just going to brief us a little bit with the intention. And then we will do the guidelines. And, uh, and then Hillary will introduce our guest speaker. Okay? So Grace Between Races is an uh, all-inclusive gathering. Our intention is to have raw, honest, and open storytelling with people of diverse uh, backgrounds, discussing their experiences of inequalities between the races and how those experiences have affected them personally and in society as a whole. We facilitate an atmosphere of support to bring about greater harmony and healing to all beings. The guidelines are um speak from we ask you to speak from the heart um, about your experiences to honor your own and others truth be encouraging and supportive of others truth as well be mindful of time open to receive feedback and as usual as we say from week to week you know keep an open mind and be happy, you know, 
have give yourself gratitude, uh, put a smile on your face, bring some lightness to this whole thing. Um, I think the world is full of, of heaviness in itself. And um, this is for me, one of the reasons why I'm even um, participating in and, and, and being a part of this is um, not to get away from, but I mean, empower, uh, empowerment for me is very important. I mean, everywhere you turn, there's always something negative that's there. Um, but I do believe that life is not only about that. I do believe that we are educated and programmed in a certain way to focus on what it is we don't want. It's, it's very easy. We are habitual beings and it's very easy for us to get caught up in that. But um, if we want to bring about some kind of change, we, we need to empower ourselves first and then that could carry over to others. Okay, so. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Hillary, introduce the guest speaker. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Anne. That was really lovely. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I'm super grateful Chastity joined us today and was willing because, you know, sometimes we're like, oh, we're going to have this guest speaker and then it doesn't really work out. And then we're like, who's going to join us? And then yeah. magically, I meet Chastity <laughs> and I'm like, we need you on Grace Between Races. No, I, <laughs> I wasn't desperate, yet she <clears throat> forward in a really beautiful way and is being really courageous to share with us. And, um, and, and I want to introduce you, and I will, but I want to do a little bit before we get there because I know there's, there's a lot that you're carrying and that we're all carrying as we, we come to this space. And um, so I want to just say from this place that um, I invite us to really be fully present with where we are. And I was grateful for the breathing exercises Oh, look, it's Ike <laughs> <laughs> from the RV. <laughs> <laughs> couldn't miss it, couldn't miss it, sorry. <laughs> I'm going to mute you. Thanks for joining us, though. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so <sighs> I want to encourage us to just close our eyes again and notice our bodies and notice if there's any gratitude for being in a body, if we, can, if we can muster up a little bit of gratitude for what it is to be here and to be as healthy as we are. Because <sighs> I'm working in a hospital and I'm around a lot of sick people and I am feeling really grateful for my body these days and how my body connects me to wherever I am and also connects me to what I value and who I love. So I invite you to notice what you're connected to physically right now, where you're sitting or standing or driving. And I invite you to just relax into it wherever you are. You can move, you can breathe. And to find yourself resting a little bit more and I invite you to feel into an awareness of rooting, whatever that means for you. For me, it's feeling like I have roots growing down from my, my spinal cord um, and feeling that extension into the earth that I can let go through and I can also breathe in support. I can breathe in nourishment from the earth. And acknowledging this connection to this earth, this being that, that holds us. Honoring that we are never, never alone. That we are held. And we're held together. And I also invite us to also feel into this 
layer of the earth that's just below the surface of the uh, the soil that that is where the mycelium is where these like mushroom network exists and this network is a lot like the nervous system of the body as I've gotten to learn more about the nervous system and about mycelium it's really similar it's this network where there's chemicals and messages sent from plant to plant and it's this way of bridging connection and sharing knowledge and information so i invite you to imagine breathing and feeling into that place into that layer of the earth and this is also where jaywa one of our honored guests talks a lot about how we can transform some of the the trauma that we've experienced into wisdom through this network and that we can then share with each other through this through this network of our own nervous systems we actually can feel each other's nervous systems we're really that sensitive as beings so see if you can rest a little bit into this layer of your own topsoil in your body and the topsoil of the earth. Allow yourself to move and breathe as you need to. <sighs> Honoring that we are connected in so many ways. And I also invite us to honor the indigenous people of the land where we are from this layer, from this awareness, and to honor whoever they are, whatever their names are, known and unknown. And I wish that their cultures may flourish and may thrive, and that their people and communities may flourish and thrive as well. And as a representative of the settler people, I want to say I'm sorry. I'm sorry for how the settlers on this land have disregarded and destroyed aspects of your culture. I've tried to. Hmm. <sighs> And I also want to acknowledge our own ancestors, our own lineages, wherever we come from, wherever our ancestors come from, and that we honor our own heritage, whatever we know and whatever we don't know, and that we can feel into and breathe into those connections as well. And lastly, I want to invite us to call in any support, any guidance, any wisdom that we are wanting to have with us during this call tonight. And that may be spiritual guidance. It could be someone from our lives who we consider a benefactor. It could be an animal or a plant or a place or some value that we are calling in right now or even intention to notice what arises in our mind in our consciousness Mm -hmm. 
And I invite you to open your eyes if you have them closed. To join us in the group again. <sighs> and I want to invite us to go around and say our name and say a very short intention that we have for being here tonight. Maybe it's one word or a phrase. So I'll start. My name is Hillary and I am here to, to grow and um, to rest into compassion. And you can just come off of mute and do popcorn. Hi, my name is Anne, and um, I'm here with presence, sitting with presence. That's what I feel today. Um, to bring in more presence. I'm Chastity, and um, the words that come to mind are um, an offering and love. Thank you both. Who's next? <laughs> we can't hear you, Ike. Yeah, I'll unmute you. There we go. Oh, I'm unmute. Yeah, I couldn't do it. I'm on the I'm driving. Um, yeah, drive safe. <laughs> I'm Ike. And my first intention is not to crash. <laughs> While I, um, I just hear everyone's stories, different stories on this, on this channel. And I guess today we're hearing your story, Chastity, so, yeah. Um, so that's my intention. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I want to listen and learn with an open heart and mind. Thanks, Carrie. Okay, Beanie. My dog. <laughs> My dude. Okay. Here, I'll unmute you. There you go. I'm Prakash. My intention is to listen deeply from the heart and learn and grow with everyone. Mm. And compassion for all beings. Thanks, Prakash. Beautiful. <laughs> so, and before we jump in to having Chastity share with us, did you want to share a little bit of where we are with Grace Between Races right now? I'm hearing it. I'm oh. you going in and out. Oh, okay. okay. Can you hear me now, Anne? Yes, I can. And did you want to share a little bit about where we are as a group in Grace Between Races right now? Or do you want to yeah, say? Um, can you hear me though? Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, um, A question came up, and I, um, uh, from, if I may, carry, and um, about whether the gathering, the group, race between races, is a spiritual group, or, um, or we don't have any religious connection at all. So if we call ourselves um, a spiritual group. Um, and we, I, I wrote something on the page of Race Between Races about it already, but I'll just uh, reemphasize uh, why we decided to, to stick with, yes, it is a spiritual process that we, we, we're looking at um, from that perspective. And the reason why... Um, I chose to, to say yes, along with Hillary, 
from what I'm giving you from my perspective here now is that um, I do believe that um, whether we choose to call it spiritual, our, our spiritual selves or our, our energy or source or however we choose to, the label we give it, um, I think um, it's really not the important thing. Um, uh, what's important is the, is the journey together that we're having. This is exploratory. It's, um, I mean, like as I said, mentioned in videos before, I am not a guru. I am not, I don't see myself as um, anybody what to do and all of that. But I do feel that as a human being living in this human experience, uh, I, uh, and my higher source. Oh, she's cutting in and out right now. Hmm. So she's frozen. I'm frozen. Uh -huh. yeah. yeah, but you can hear you. We can't. You're frozen. In the okay. Video. Okay, and so um, th this is one of the reasons why I chose a spiritual um, journey uh, because I do uh, feel that um, the physical aspect of ourselves. Um, is, is secondary and I do feel that the soul or the spirit or the, the higher, higher self, source energy part of us is the primary. And uh, um, everybody's entitled to their wording, their way of looking at it. And I feel like this group is, we're leaving it open so that people could have discussion. This is why we say all inclusive because the world is full of, we're trying to get away from um, divisions. Yeah. We want to come together and in all aspects of life, this is where it's pointing us. All the religious. Just, I need you to just lie down and just be mm -hmm. poor. Poor, it shows that the oneness is, is what's important. Love, love, love is, is not everywhere. It's in everything for everything, and it is who we are. And unfortunately, we have deviated from that in so many different ways. And um, we are now living the experience of that division. So from that perspective, this is why I'm calling, I would choose to call it a spiritual <laughs> journey exploration if you will and um so um if you know i've in, invite people to sit with us and, and share their perspective if they have something um, else to add to that or they see something that doesn't fit or sit right with them bring it to the table and we could we could discuss it as well but um this is the perspective i'm coming from and i think I I I'm, I'm, I can't speak for Hillary. She will give her take on it, but um, we had a discussion and we both decided to to use uh, the spiritual process. Um, yeah. You know. You you want to take it from here, Hillary? Go ahead. Sure. Yeah. I just I appreciate you sharing your thoughts and mm -hmm. um, and your grounding in your beliefs and, and for me it was really exciting to talk with chastity while we were having this conversation actually i got your response carrie right when i was about to talk with chastity and for me um what, <laughs> what chastity is sharing about aligns really with my own experience of having this like awakening journey yeah. and um the intersection of that with racism and with racism exactly and so for me i've been on this like spiritual journey 
I, that's the way I've thought in my life. And I haven't questioned, well, I've questioned a lot of things about God and religion, but I haven't questioned being a spiritual being ever in my life. Um, that said, as a Buddhist, there's a lot of very um, like practical elements in Buddhism. And some people even believe that Buddhism isn't a religion, and so, which is interesting. And we're not going to go into that right now. But the Buddhism uses the word consciousness. And Chastity and I were really enjoying using that word. And she's going to talk a lot more about that. But consciousness as the way in which our minds um, are connected and that we all are connected through consciousness. And, you know, and I'm sure Prakash has a lot to offer in this conversation as well. And I'm sure Ike who just popped off has a lot as well. Um, and, and I think this is where grace between races is, um, is situated is between this, is this process of awakening through learning about racism and, and our own experience of racism and how it's, for me, I've experienced it as a separation, as like a cut of that consciousness, awesome. that continuous consciousness. And so if we can learn about how racism is created systemically and how prejudice, bigotry is in our lives, then we're taking some of that separation out, possibly, in order to feel more connected, to realize we are more connected to each other. So anyways, there's a lot more I could say about that. And if you're interested and you're in the area, moving in grace, awakening through racial reconciliation, we're going to practice that on Friday um, in an embodied way. Um, and we cultivated an actual process that we're still cultivating and we're learning about Kelvin Young and I, um, about how to wake up to being human in a world where there is racism mm -hmm. and acknowledging racism and saying, okay, I'm going to claim my security, my safety, my power, acknowledge my privilege, and I'm going to be able to be in relationship with other cultures and people who may look different, act different, have different life experience from me. And how do I do that? Um, so anyways, so that's my perspective. And I'm thrilled you're here, Chastity. That's great, yeah. And, really and I can say a lot about you and who you are. And I'm also just getting to know you. But I just want to say that I felt this incredible soul connection with you. And, so, um, and for me, that means this sense of consciousness. Like, I feel like our consciousnesses just get each other somehow. Yeah. And it's probably because we're doing some of this work, similar shared purpose. Yeah. And... Um, and I, you have so much life experience and perspective, and I know you'll share about that. Um, you, and you have promised to interrupt me with guiding questions if I start to ramble all over the map. <laughs> sure, I'm happy to do that, but I really look forward to hearing your story. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I also want to acknowledge that my dog is here. And so if I'm a little bit like looking over to the left or right, it's because my little... Um, Puppins. I just got home and if I lock him away, he'll just be really mad later on. So he's just with me on the couch. Um, sorry about that. I love what you said, Hillary, about you experienced racism as separation. Um, because that's exactly right. And racism loses when we all stay in connection with each other, right? Um, and racism is, 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 uh, is a tool that is very targeted and used and works most effectively when we each identify very, very strongly and closely with this body that we're in. Um, that's what I have found. And so I'll, I'll start, that. I just wanted to say that because that's what came to mind when you were speaking. Um, but yeah, I'll speak. My name is Chastity Rodriguez. I'm 46 years old. My background is um, I have a bachelor's degree in African American studies from Columbia University. Then I got a master's in education from the University of New Haven. Then I got a master's in marriage and family therapy from Central Connecticut State University. I also got a pastoral counseling degree from Phoenix Online University. And then I also went to the Institute of Healing Arts and Sciences um, for two years and became an energy medicine practitioner. 
So um, like at the top of my resume is like one of my favorite quotes by J.R. Tolkien, which says, not all who wander are lost. Um, the path that I navigated through my education um, is very closely aligned to how I identified. When I identified strongly as a Puerto Rican girl, um, I went to Columbia University purely because it was Ivy League. And that was going to validate me. And somehow I had made it. I, I was worth something because I got accepted by that university. But I'm getting ahead of myself. That's my background. Um, so today, I just want, we're, Hillary and I were talking. And I, I remember saying to her, um, you know, race isn't real, but racism is. And the more we talk about race, the more life we give to it. It, it just started, it would frustrate me, right? I wanted to get to the place where everybody could talk about racism without acknowledging race because it's not a real thing. It's a construct. Um, but that's where I got through a very traumatic event. Um, and not everybody gets there. Right. So the title of this little chat is race isn't real. Racism is, and it's layered. Racism is layered. It's ideological, institutional, interpersonal, and internalized. Right. So I'm going to, so we all have like a similar vocabulary. I just want to read the definitions of those different um, forms of racism. Okay. And if I'm, if you're already familiar with these terms, please stop me. Okay. But um, does it help if I hold it up like this or should I just read it? I can read it. Yeah, probably if you read it. All right. Ideological racism, the racist values and beliefs of our culture reproduced by the media, schools, and institutions like banks, um, uh, like the house, all the departments uh, in DC, um, media, schools, and institutions that determine our daily realities. So that's ideological racism, okay? Um, what we see on TV, when you Google the word beauty and you look up image, you hit images and it's all white women, right? That's ideological racism. Um, our schools, um, uh, my history is considered an elective, but you know, white European American history is the requirement. That's ideological racism. Then we have institutional racism and that's the racist policies, practices, and procedures of the institutions and organizations that determine our day-to-day -day realities. Um, and so that's like voting, um, again, schools, um, certain, you know, banks, jobs, like how, when you go in for an interview, when you go to try to apply for a loan. Um, so that's ideological and institutional. Then we have interpersonal racism. Interpersonal is acting out our racist beliefs and attitudes on others, the impact of which harms people of color. And then the last one is internal, internalized racism. And that's our internal racist beliefs and implicit biases that we hold sometimes about ourselves, including internalized racial superiority and internalized racial inferiority. And so through that lens, racism hurts everybody, right? It hurts those of us that come out of it with an inter internalized inferiority complex. And it also hurts those of us that come out of it with an inter internalized superiority complex. Um, so I'm gonna talk about my, how I identified how it has changed from when I was born to where I am now and how that has impacted my ability um, to mitigate, right? Not erase entirely, but mitigate the effects of interpersonal racism, internalized racism, and then also ideological and institutional. Okay. So from 1973 to 2005, I identified as, and very reluctantly, as a Puerto Rican girl, right? Um, ideologically, I was socialized by the media and by schools and by the messages I received around me. I was socialized to believe that Puerto Ricans weren't real Americans. We were immigrants. Um, we had too many children. We were loud. Um, I was always embarrassed of my large family that would come to say school events. I had way too many cousins. Um, uh, ideologically, I learned I wanted to be white, full stop. That was, you know, um, uh, real Americans, and I was all about assimilation. Um, that was me when I identified as a Puerto Rican girl, all the way up until 2005. Institutionally, um, my family had no generational wealth to pass on down. Um, 
the uh, assumption in high school when I got accepted to Columbia University, everybody assumed it was because they were trying to fill a quota. Never mind that I was like a straight A student and pretty brilliant, if I do say so myself. Um, so that was another way of institutional racism impacting me when I identified strongly as a Puerto Rican girl. Um, the, like, I went to a private school because our local public schools weren't safe for me to go to and they weren't quality educational institutions. So I had to go to an all white institution and I went to all white schools from about fourth grade to 12th grade. And a lot of my identity was shaped around whiteness um, where I experienced a lot of interpersonal racism. People asking me questions um, about what it was like to be Puerto Rican that were just really offensive. Um, being made fun of my hair, I remember telling you, Hillary, that you know, girls would come up to me and be like, ew, your hair's so gross. Ew, your hair looks like pubic hair. Ew, does your hair even get wet in the shower? Um, uh, and then internally, right? Internally, I internalized all these messages as I identified as a Puerto Rican girl, as you know, I am supposed to be really good at cooking. I'm supposed to be really good at cleaning. I'm supposed to be super sexy. Um, my mom had internalized racism from um, aligning with the colonizers, right? So Puerto Rico was colonized by European Spaniards. So the lighter skin and the softer and straighter your hair was, the better. And the darker your skin was and the kinkier or curly your hair was, the worse. So my sister had hair very similar to Hillary's and mine, I don't know if you can tell it, I just chopped it all off. But I have very, very, very curly hair that as it grows out, grows up, 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 and then will fall over eventually. Um, so my mom would do my sister's hair and she loved it and it was l happiness and joy. And then I would get in between her legs and I would, and she would, I, I would hear it. She was like, ugh, thank God your skin is light because this hair, in Spanish though, right? And so from when I identified strongly as a Puerto Rican girl, racism hurt me on every single level, ideologically, institutionally, interpersonally, and internally, right? Then in 2005, in 2005, um, I was 31 years old. I had a, a new little baby that I had reluctantly, I'd been married for about five years. I had a five-year, uh, a 10-month-old baby that I had reluctantly agreed to conceive. Um, I had a mortgage that for a house, I really, a condo I didn't really want. Um, oh, before I get there, when I identified strongly as the Puerto Rican girl and I'd been so wounded by racism, all I wanted in life was to be, to pass for a light-skinned black woman. If I was a light-skinned black woman, that was a step above Puerto Rican woman because she was a real American. Um, and so I started dating when I was about 19 and then got engaged at 24 and married at 25, a very bourgeoisie black man. His grandfather graduated from Lincoln University in like 1920 something, where like, I think maybe three men, three black men probably graduated from college in this country in 1920 something. Um, and so he was a very, very well-established, very, very upper middle class black family. So I had really, really won the jackpot. Like I was so happy to go from being Chastity Rodriguez to Chastity Hamilton. Um, because from that place, I was a real American. I didn't have to pause anymore on the phone with operators. They would say, you know, how do you spell that? I remember the first time, you know, first name Chastity, next, last name Hamilton, address. I was like, oh, there's no pause there. I don't have to now spell my name for them. There were these little markers that made me feel very much like I belonged in America. Uh, because I had married well and married away from my Latinaness and right into a um, light-skinned, black, bougie American family. Woo, winning. Okay. Then in 2005, my husband died very suddenly in a car accident. Um, and so I was left with my, the, the little, the baby, right? The 10-month-old Noah and the condo. And literally the way I describe it is my brain broke. It just broke. Um, and the blessing, the gift um, of that break was this sudden and um, immediate detachment from the identity that I had held on to my whole life, which was I'm a Puerto Rican woman living in America. Um, the detachment from that identity and this attachment and, and all of this instant knowing, this intimate knowing that, wow, we are not these meat suits that we incarnate into. We are actually the consciousness inside of this body experiencing life on this plane as whatever body we happened to incarnate into um, but that at our core and at our at our truest place 
we were all the same. We were all connected. And the only thing that mattered was being really good to yourself, loving yourself and accepting yourself and doing the same for others, loving and accepting others. So I went from identifying as a Puerto Rican woman to identifying as the consciousness inside this body. And that's how I started raising my son, 10 months old. He was not raised to be a proud Puerto Rican boy. He was not raised to be a proud black boy. He was raised to be a really, really, really um, intentional conscious being. And, and it was fun and easy to raise him that way until I released him into the world. Because the world will identify you for you, even if you don't identify as that thing, right? Um, so before I get there, so ideologically, so think about this, 2005, I'm suddenly widowed. I have this immediate break from reality, right? Um, I recognize the truth of what my existence here. And I am, I inherit, I, I get all of this, I call it death money, right? Life insurance money. So because of this money I inherited, I was able to lessen the impact of institutional racism, right? I had my condo, I had a car. Actually, I, got, I had so many cars between 2005 and now because that was what I would do with the money. I would go turn a car in and get another car, then two years later, turn that car in. Dealers love to see me coming because I had a lot of money, right? Um, the, uh, ideologically, I completely cut myself off from all social media, television, none of the programming that was supposed to be aimed at you know, um, me as a person of color, if it didn't get through to me because I was reading nothing but spiritual texts, right? From all different traditions. Um, and so ideologically that was minimized because I was in this cocoon, this buffer that this money afforded me. Um, institutionally, uh, baby Noah, my son, had it all. He had it good. He had everything he wanted until 2008 when the economy tanked. Um, but institutionally, um, the money protected me from the institutions that would have denied me access if I didn't have that money, right? And then interpersonally, I was able to pick and choose the energy that I wanted to have around me, right? The money also gave me this buffer. And um, internally, poof, all of my inferiority complex was just gone because I was no longer a Puerto Rican woman. I was solely, squarely, wholly, fully, intimately the consciousness inside this body. Now, I had no practice to sustain that. That was the gift that I received from being horribly, horribly traumatized by being suddenly widowed and left behind with a baby I didn't necessarily want and a home I didn't necessarily want. Um, so that was me from 2005 till about 2012 when I called myself uh, a lady of leisure, right? I wasn't working. I was, um, I, I lived off of the life insurance money dividends and I was able to really cocoon myself from the world, right? And get really strong into my identity as this consciousness. Then I had to take a job. So in 2012, I went to work at an independent day school as a school counselor. Remember I had no practice to sustain the consciousness, right? The, um, the identity that I had associated with. And so after about two years, it only took two years to drain me of the eight years <laughs> that I had kind of like um, built up. But after two years of working in a very, very racist, very, very white, very asleep to their whiteness, very fragile um, white women, women who were very intimidated or irritated by me, um, in those two years, I was like, it was almost like coming, like when people have near death experiences and they talk about being slammed back into their bodies. It was like, all of a sudden I was slammed back into being, oh yeah, you're a Puerto Rican girl and don't you forget it. Um, ideologically, I started watching more television. I was on, I had Instagram and I was on social media again. I was reading the news, Google news, Yahoo news, everything you were talking about and how it's all just negative, right? Um, I, um, it was making me feel crappy about myself. I institutionally, I was working at this, at this independent day school that was built for the privileged. It was a school that was founded in uh, 1909 because six families didn't want their very special children to go to school with the masses. So they hired somebody from England to come over and started tutoring their children. And so the school where I worked, you know, 100, 200 years later, whatever, it was, it, it, it was working the way it was designed to work 
to give access and privilege, access to the privileged and the entitled, and to make those of us who were kind of guests there feel like we were lucky to be there and you shouldn't also experience, you shouldn't expect to have a healthy, wholesome experience, just be happy that you're here. Um, so institutionally, I was watching black and brown children be wounded daily there. And I had no voice, I had no power there. Um, and I was, that was making me feel really sick and sad. Um, and then watching my son, he went to the middle school there and he would come home daily and say, well, mom, apparently black boys like sports. The next day he'd come home, well, mom, apparently black boys are good at fighting. And he'd come home another day, well, mom, apparently black boys have really big penises. He was just learning all these stereotypes at school because I had never, I didn't raise him to be, I literally let this little spirit inside of a black boy body go off into the world. The poor kid, he had no preparation. Um, and so watching all that happen, interpersonally, I was assaulted by microaggressions every day, right? Um, all day, every day. And so with no practice, no practice of meditation, no practice of embodiment, no practice of community, I just collapsed into my old identity, right? And I embraced anger, right? Anger to cover up this inferiority complex that had just been kicked up again. Um, and so before, when I was identified as a Puerto Rican woman, I didn't have anger. I had self-hatred and I wanted to be just like white people. And I thought white was right and straight was great. I used to straighten my hair so much. Fast forward to me now, I'm angry, right? I don't think white is right. I don't think straight is great, but I hate them and I'm angry. And that's no good either. Cause I remembered and I missed the feeling of cosmic connection and universal love. And I couldn't believe that all I was seeing again was everybody's meat suits instead of their divinity. And I was so sad and angry about it. Um, so I just basically collapsed into old patterns of belief and beliefs all the way until about 2018. Until 2019, when I was pretty much at the lowest place I had, I had been in, in in recent years in terms of my health and my ability to access love. Um, I was raging against white people. Um, my son, I, 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 like he had gone from like, but mom, I thought you told me that, you know, White people are just, you know, like uh, they need patience and compassion and guidance. And now I was like, you know what? Don't trust them. Stay away from them. You know, like the messages that I had started to, that I had internalized as a young person. And I wanted to interrupt that. And I had this moment, I was like crying and screaming at whoever, the universe, spirit, source, whatever you want to call it, but screaming like, I need help hold me close. I'm slipping away. Help me. Um, I need a community. I need a teacher. And, um, and I promised my deal was I'll say yes to whatever opportunities show up. And I was given this opportunity to facilitate a workshop called showing up whole for racial justice. And I was like, really? <laughs> um, this is what I'm supposed to say yes to, but I did. And I went and I walked in and almost everyone in that room was white except for two people, I think. Um, but by the end of the weekend, I, I remember I, I was able to look around the room and say like, this was really healing for me. I needed to see this many white people and white faces doing this work with this much heart and intention. And it was at that circle where we had to go around the room and say, how do you identify that I made the commitment to go back to saying out loud, um, how I identify, which is I identify as the consciousness inside this meat suit. This is temporary, but I am ever genderless, ever raceless, ever uh, sexless, right? And so from there, um, that's how I identified. I said, but the world, when I'm Chastity Rodriguez, identifies me as Afro-Latina. And when I'm Chastity Hamilton, the world identifies me as very irritating and confusing because they can't figure out what I am. And that bothers a lot of people. And so, um, but what I've taken away, so from that year, because that's when I met Prakash, and that's when I found a spiritual meditation community and a meditation path that is committed to self-realization, remembering that you are the consciousness inside this body and service to humanity, right? So I went into service to humanity without a practice and I burned out. With the practice, I'm hoping to continue this service to humanity forever. 
And so now because I identify again as the consciousness inside this meat suit, I'm back at my job, summer's off, I'm back now. Um, this uh, this recommitment or re-attachment um, to my original identity of my consciousness happened in April. And so now it's September. I'm back at school and I can see the divinity in my coworkers again. I can feel compassion for them again. Their microaggressions land on me as reflections of the fucked up system that we have all been educated under, that we've all been wounded by. I see white people's internalized superiority as a thing that like, oh my gosh, the, that must be awful. What a burden to walk around with. Imagine if the expectation is you better succeed, you better make it all the way to the top. You're white. You don't have an excuse not to. Ooh, what a burden, you know? And so now because I identify again as this consciousness and I have this community and this practice of morning meditation and night meditation, because of that, interpersonal racism does not hurt me as much as it used to. Um, internalized racism, my internalized inferiority complex, I'm able to heal it. I'm able to sit with it and start to give it the love and the healing it needs. And ideological and institutional racism, I don't see it anymore as just this thing that's aimed at me. I see it as a problem in our country and our world that we are all suffering under, that we are all harmed by. And so from that perspective, it doesn't beat me down. It doesn't hurt me down into submission. Um, and I'm also very aware of my privilege. I have this skin, like my mom said in her internalized racism, right? Thank God you're light skin, because this hair, right? So I know the privilege of this light skin. I know that the, the um, institutional racism that I receive and the interpersonal racism that I receive is minuscule compared to my black sister friends, right? My whole crew, oh, so when I got to Columbia University, I didn't want one white friend. I went to school with white people from fourth grade to 12th grade and at Columbia, I didn't have one white friend for four years. My whole friend group was black women, black American women from um, New York, the South and California. Um, and with them, I was more than happy to pass as their light-skinned black sister, even though they knew I was Puerto Rican. But I was trying very hard back then, remember, to pass as a light-skinned black woman because that was more American. But I know what they suffer and what they deal with daily um, in a way that I never did because of this skin, right? Um, and even if I was passing as a light-skinned black woman, that was a privilege too because I had the, the right uh, curl texture, the right curl pattern. The wrong one for Puerto Ricans, but the right ones for African Americans. And why? Because of this silly program we all suffer under, right? Um, did I babble? <laughs> um, yeah, I think that's, that's pretty much the gist of it. Um, I'm happy to like engage in like a dialogue or talk more about any pieces that stuck out or resonated with people or um, need further investigation. Mm, thank you so much. Wow, I I just could feel um, like the layers unpeeling off of me as you're sharing. Mm. And, um, <laughs> of expansion into this beyond identity -ness. Yeah. Um, and uh, I feel that when I'm with you. Right on. I'm really grateful for that. And yeah, I want to open it up. Um, Anne, if you have any questions or feedback, and then we can go around. Thank you very much, Chastity. That was awesome, like absolutely on point. Mm. Um, can you guys hear me? Yes. Thank you, Anne, for saying that. You're such an inspiration and um, quite honestly, um, you know, I'm, I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago from the Caribbean. So we're island sisters, Puerto Rico. We are considered a melting pot. Most of the so-called black people in, in, in the Caribbean, they appear black, but they really are a combination of many different things. And to be quite honest, uh, white supremacy, I see it as a virus that um, really separates people internally as well as externally. Yes. Um, 
because if you if you accept one aspect of yourself it, it just means that you have to deny other aspects of yourself and this division tears people from the inside out and i um because I, I i you know like i'm coming from a background where i on my father's side there's a lot of Spanish, in, um, French and Spanish influence, and um, even on my mother's uh, side. And um, I, um, from very young, I never, you know, I grew up with a lot of East Indian as neighbors and, and, and a lot of different people and, you know, complexions so varied and all kinds of stuff. Mm -hmm. to their children, whether one was lighter. And so I could totally, um, um, you know, understand um, with your sister and, and the whole con construct of that, you know? Yeah. Um, so this, this, and this is, this is why I'm happy to do this kind of work because then we could really speak um, in our own voices about yeah. our own experiences with all of this stuff. Yes. You know, it's a very down to earth and root, rootsy kind of way to face the reality rather than seeing it from a from an institution where everything is, uh, you know, like you, you read it from a book, this is life, both own experience, day to day, everyday experiences with, with the reality of race. Yeah. yeah and yeah. how it affected them. Yeah, and you know, and and, and I and so oh, sorry. Oh, I was gonna say I I was a I'm a per diem facilitator with this race and equity center, and when we I'm going to be, right yeah so I'm going to be teaching those four eyes of oppression tomorrow at Saint Joseph University to incoming freshmen, and I wanted to share the story right. of interpersonal racism with my mother, passing down her internalized right. racism to me, but the but the facilitators. Right did not want me to. They said, no, we don't want the first example of interpersonal racism to be from your mother to you. We want it to be from a white person to you. And I tried to push back and I said, but doesn't yes. it show that racism affects all of us? Like not just white people? Yeah, exactly. Wouldn't it be, wouldn't exactly. it be powerful and helpful to let white people not feel so guilty? Like, look, my mom also suffered from, my mom was racist to me. Exactly. Like, you don't have to feel bad, yes. white person. We are all suffering from it. For, um, this is, this but is they wouldn't let me do it, so I was happy to do it here. <laughs> exactly. This is why I said that it's, in the, in, 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 if you look back at some of the other videos, I said it's, it's the two sides of the same coin. And the suffering is across the board because what I'm what we consider superiority and what a burden and I glad I'm, I'm so happy that you brought that out what a burden to walk with with the lies of what that that entails and the yes. children who had to inherit that and um they walking around knowing that it was all a constructed lie um towards other people then because they are waking up to the reality of what the lies are and they have the burden of that to carry yes and for me personally um this is why i i take the stand of um not really um getting too much in the right and wrong of 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 this whole thing because to be quite honest we are our ancestors we're all guilty we are all guilty we are when it comes to putting blame and i don't like blame and 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 the last from the last video i mentioned it's very important for people to come today to look at themselves through the eyes of source and not through the eyes from of outside there and what's right and wrong and color and all of this. Mm -hmm. We've got to come back to the self and look at ourselves through the eyes of source. Our original beingness is really love. Yep. yep. And yep. once we could come back there, um, get back to that point, I think it would be the healing would, would, would start happening across the board. But we are waking up, you know. Yeah. You yeah. were going to say something? Um, I don't remember. Uh, yeah. Okay. So maybe I have a question for you. Okay. So your experience with, with the whole um, 
uh, institutionalized racism. Um, can you elaborate on um, the difference of how that, I mean, you mentioned about seeing it in, the, in, in that special school, but um, how do you see it affecting white people? We're talking on both sides of the spectrum, and how do you see it affecting black kids? Hmm. Okay, so institutionalized, how I see it affecting black children is in the yes, curriculum. Yes, because you, you said yeah. you saw I would say black kids being affected. In our, yes, absolutely. In our curriculum, and not just in private schools, but in public mm -hmm. schools as well. It, curric right. Our curriculum from kindergarten to 12th grade is super problematic. Right. It teaches it, mm -hmm. it teaches white kids to either feel like, gosh, I'm awesome, I'm such a savior, or um, it teaches white kids to feel really guilty. And like neither one of those are good. Right. And it teaches black yeah. kids, oh my gosh, like we were like, we start teaching black kids about their history with slavery instead of going back to Mansa Musa yeah. and like glorious, like right. African, right. Okay. So it's institutionalized in our curriculum. That's the, that's the way I see it mm -hmm. very, very strongly in this mm -hmm. country and how it affects white people and right. um, black and brown children. We need seminars that teach white children right. how to be anti-racist. Our country was built and designed yeah. for whiteness like it just it's by design going right. to give whiteness an advantage and so we need white children right. to to have a, an anti-racist kind of like identity to aspire to because right now right um, they like by default they're just going to be like racist right like if you're white in america right. and you do no work to wake up to your whiteness i promise you you're racist mm -hmm. because you just that's what right. we do we make racists in this country <laughs> um so right. we need to have we like so so institutionalized curriculum um, institution the institutions of like I don't know like our banking institutions are like our educate our, our political institution is racist look at our Congress right look at how white and male it is like that's not representative of this country right um, and how does it affect white people I think so the burden of a feeling like unnecessarily guilty like that was the first time Hillary I've ever heard a settler apology. That was really interesting to me, yeah. And when you were saying it, I gotta say, because of where I, how I identify today, I was like, no, you don't have to apologize for that mess. That wasn't you, Hillary, right? That's what came up for me. Um, and then <laughs> another lens, another lens, I'm like, that's kind of beautiful. Like, mm. you know? I, 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 I hear what you're saying and I totally on point with you, but there's another aspect that I want to draw forth. Okay. Um, I think, there's a, a really subtle part that we really. Oh no, I'm missing it. Um, um, uh, kids in this society, starting from kids, all of us as a, a people, we need to focus on who we are truly as beings. Because for me, from that perspective, we need to teach children um, who they are from the ground up rather than um, um, teaching them. Uh, of course, we need the education and the curriculum and all of that, but the, important, the importance of knowing thyself. Did you get that? Yes, the importance of knowing thyself. Yeah. It reminds the me kid, of... The kid, kids need to, to learn that very early o'clock. Because when we get all this, this extracurriculum or worldly um, ways into uh, success and, and all of this, but we don't have the self, I'm, I'm seeing where this is a big problem because we fill our mind and our souls with how it is to make money and how it is to feel um, successful in, in this realm. But we are empty Many people end up with a lot of certificates and a lot of, uh, you know, whatever qualifications, but they are empty inside. And this aspect needs to be, it, it needs to be bridged. If um, This is how I'm seeing it. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. I could not agree with you more. I have a sign in my classroom that says, we are here to change the world. Not just, yes. follow, all, not just follow all the rules, make a lot of money and die. <laughs> right. Exactly, ma. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And so, so I'm and so happy. I'm so 
I'm so happy that uh, that that you you brought this point up. And this is what's coming up because this is the way I'm seeing it myself, you know. And on my journey, have really uh, shown me these things through my experiences. Yeah. But I've had a hard, tough, tough one, you know, that brought me to these uh, to these insights. Yeah. And um, um, I, but but. I, I have no complaints because for me, from where I am sitting right now, I could sit in my beingness and know like you that you just mentioned, not who I, that does not define who I am as a person at yeah. all. None of those things. Yeah. Um, yeah. And also institutionally, I'm thinking about how it harms kids, black and white, right? And everybody when we don't talk about any of these issues, when we don't talk about racism, systemic racism, uh, mm -hmm. you know, white privilege, if we don't talk about any of this all the way up until 12th grade, we create, yeah. we create terrible college campuses where right. there is nothing but like factions and like, like no one's having conversations, they're just screaming at each other and they're all standing on the wrong assumptions, the wrong definitions. That's yeah. why I really wanted to read those four definitions of racism because we cannot like some people call bigotry racism, right? Or yeah. like prejudice, you know? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And I was telling Hillary this, like, I want to just bring it down to like third grade recess language. Yes. Like yeah. you're being mean. <laughs> like yeah. you know, yeah. and and just leave it at that. Like racist, like you're just we're being mean to somebody, and you might be yeah. mean to them because they have a vagina, or maybe you're mean to them because they have black skin, or maybe you have yeah. mean to them because they have white skin or they have a penis, right? But whatever it is, right. we need right. to stop being mean to each other. <laughs> exactly. But the meanness and the violence, especially the violence that escalates from all of these things, is because people aren't feeling good within themselves. And if you if you identify strongly as a white man, right? Like if you identify strongly as a white man, you have a lot of reasons right now based on the media, based on ideological racism to be really scared and angry right now, right? Yeah. And yeah. so um if and so and so like when you when we identify with these these pieces of the game, then they can yeah. move us around the board like we're pieces in the game, right? Yeah. But yeah. if, if you just say no, this is all a game, and I'm not going to play, and I'm not, I'm not a pawn, and you're, and you're not a queen, and I'm yeah. not, like, then it's harder for the system to play us. Well, exactly. Well, for, for me personally, I have taken, I, and I told, and, and Hillary came over and she saw. I, I don't have, I don't look at TV. I don't participate. That's like the first step to like killing internalized racism. Race, exactly. TV construct that, that that really works against me in the long run it you does know, in the short, short run and in the long run it's true i did an exercise with my son we used to play this game called what you know like what what are they really selling you and it would be we'd look at a commercial you know and it's like a commercial for say razors and they show a woman shaving her legs and couple messages or subliminal messages are crazy absolutely and so and i and 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 for a little black boy to watch yes, television and that, Did like, you get that? Yeah, the subliminal messages are crazy. Did and you get that? that? Yeah, like we need to see, I have like a whole, like me and my son who's 15 and we're talking now about, you know, being out in the world. And uh, I don't know if I told you this Prakash or Hillary, but so my son, I had the same moment that my mom had with, well, at least you're light skin, right? But listen to yes. how this worked out. He's turning 15. So black boys go from being cute and cuddly and small to white people, to being scary and dangerous almost overnight. Soon as they get tall, right. soon as their body fills out, mm -hmm. now he's this scary thing. Mm -hmm. And as a mom of a black boy mm -hmm. in America, that's a terrifying transformation. I might cry. Thank you. Um, Thank you. So he wanted to grow dreadlocks. Mm -hmm. And I, knowing how this world is programmed to think about black boys with dreadlocks, was really nervous about giving him permission. I almost right. you know and almost wanted him to have a very close fade, the the respectable, yeah. the respectability politics. I wanted him to have the, yeah. the black man haircut that white America finds acceptable. Right. So he would be safer. But what am I teaching him there if I do? Yeah. So instead, I have a black son who looks scary 
And you know how I soothe myself? Because he has dreadlocks. I soothe myself, and this is disgusting, but it's true. Well, he's light skin. So he's not going to be as scary to white people. Right. And that's an awful truth that I know in my heart is something that I hold on to as a protective measure. My son is a right. little bit better off because he's really light skinned. That should counter yes. the effects of the dreadlocks. That's awful. Right. That's an awful feeling. But it's an awful feeling. But you know, I think this, this is, this is a, another aspect of the whole scenario that we have to look in is black people own biases within the construct. And, um, and this is personal and internal work that we need to, to do yeah. that, um, how we feel about ourselves, our own skin and our, our, our own whatever. Um, it's very real that we are very biased within our, our own skin about light and dark. That's our and internalized, we, that's our internalized it, racism. Exactly. Yeah. And so we need to clarify, we need to clear ourselves from that and not project that on other people. And then we go outside and we stand up and we say um, to white people, you're prejudiced. But we are prejudiced within our own selves, with our, within our own communities and mm -hmm. families. Yes. So this is something that really needs to be addressed within our own selves. And it cannot be done by anybody else. White people cannot do it for us. We have to love ourselves at the core. Yes. And at, at the end of the day, it all boils down to love. You know, nobody could hate us into love. People yes. have to love themselves, with, whether you're white or you're black, you have to, or in between, you've got to love yourself because we are all that. Yes. This is and why I'm saying. It's, so it's hard. It's very difficult. Like I know, so I have a very dear black sister friend who yes. immigrated to the United States at 16 from mm -hmm. London and her family's from Jamaica. Right. So she's not a black American woman by any means, but she lives in America. She doesn't right. have the same, she doesn't have the same generational trauma and wounding mm -hmm. that a black American woman mm -hmm. who was brought here in 1619, right? Her right. that generational wounding and that self-hatred has been ingrained by design and so i agree that we have to love ourselves but i want to make sure that it's not just like you know like blaming ourselves for not loving ourselves right well exactly yeah exactly. and i liked i like to highlight over and over, I, I can do that here they won't let me do it at the recenter but yes. i really do want to highlight the fact that racism the same way it like it, it affects all of us you know like it affects white people and us like we internalize it too so that's how you know it's not just like it's a systemic thing right like yeah. when 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 black when africans and when, when when there are nigerian women who are putting on light skin lightning cream in exactly a yeah filled with black faced women like that is a yeah. powerful drug whiteness it's a powerful yeah. drug yeah. yeah because of all the power that's been associated with it right yeah yeah um and so that's I, why I my mean, mom... I mean, that's, that, this is, it, that runs so deep, it's not even funny. Like, this is why, I mean, I think we're just scratching the surface right now, but at, at least it's a, start, a step in the right direction. And Anne, is there a part of you that is feeling any kind of self-consciousness about three white ears listening to this conversation? Um, you know what? Like, I, I work my way through that, that already. Um, yeah. No, I have no qualms about that. I could sit down in any. I go to this. I would go to the synagogue and sit down between a whole bunch of um, white people. I mean, Canada. Canada I'm, I'm living in Canada. I um, have been tested in so many different ways yeah. that I had to walk through a lot of those things. Yeah. Um, I've been in situation where I went to. Uh, um, I. And um, I was not only just not the black, the black person in the room, but I was the only black woman in the room, the only woman in the room. So to be, to be, to stand up in that and, you know, in front of those men and be the only black person and the only woman. Yeah. Um, it tested my, 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 my strength, my, you know, yeah. my confidence. 
And so putting my, myself through a lot of these different um, uncomfortable situations have pushed me to grow in so many different ways. Sure. So no, I don't. And I grew up with East Indians. I slept with them. I, we were neighbors. We, yeah. Like I grew up with a lot of diversity. So yeah. um, I have no discomfort and maybe that's what people pick up around me. Yeah. So I could walk into any, any place I've walked into I've dated a Mexican guy. Um, I walked into yeah, yeah. <laughs> I walked into to stores here. You don't where, have um, yeah. when you walk when when I walk in, the people started to um, profile me right away because like you're not supposed to be in here, you you know, like yeah. and so um, and I walked in and I just hold my head up high and I I I, I look and I I do whatever I felt like doing because mm -hmm. I wasn't disturbing the peace. I wasn't doing anything wrong. So yeah, I pushed the envelope yeah. because I know who I, I know who I am, who I am. I have friends. I have like black friends who are like, you know, if you share with white people that um, we have internalized racism too, and that we, you know, uh, prioritize lighter skin or, you know, a different texture of hair that we're going to give white people the opportunity to absolve themselves to go, oh, well, see, you guys do it too. Um, and so that's like a, like a very, um, like a trade off. Yeah. And so, and I, and, 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 and what I want to say, and like, I, this is not a popular uh, sentiment, but like, right. I want white people to absolve themselves. They're individuals. Yeah. They didn't create the racist systemic racism in this country. So go ahead and absolve yourselves because guilt just keeps people stuck. We don't need no. white people. Like we need white people who are actively helping to dismantle systemic yes. racism. <laughs> exactly. And I, 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 my, my intention for this thing is for white people to really, really understand who they are from a core place yeah. and not just from a money or success um, um, who they're told to so, be exactly right I, I think that's the wake awakening for for white people is to really be honest grillingly honest with themselves and know that they are not superior to anybody yeah yeah they are they are beautiful loving beings that are on this planet to do their purpose like everybody else that's right yeah absolutely also yeah. understand that the core message for black people is that that whole inferiority thing that they, they that we are uh, carrying on is we are holding it in position by the way we are believing, buying into it and continue uh, sending it mess the messages down from generation to generation. That bullshit needs to stop. Agreed. We are human, Agreed. full of love, full of, of, of and all this thing. Look, the essence of, 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 of us as a people are so beautiful, so beautiful that pe other people, even white people, wants to learn everything that we, we have to offer. Yeah. We need to stand up and own our own power and our own graciousness and our own divinity. Mm -hmm. White people need to do it. Black people need to do it. Absolutely. I feel like the system treats it speaks to our grossest parts of our nature it speaks to the most exactly. parts of us and not to our higher like uh aspirations you know like if all you want to do is make a billion dollars and buy a tesla like there's so much more there's so much more to life um and when you're reduced to just how capitalism reduces us to just pr producers or consumers like that's why racism and capitalism go Hand in hand. Yeah, absolutely. Because uh, like, I, I, I don't believe white slave owners all hated black people. I think they really liked free labor. Sorry. I, I said, I don't believe that all white slave owners hated all yeah. of the black slaves. I think they really liked the free labor and the bottom line. And so they told themselves and did things, they dehumanized themselves in order to be able to continue to own other human beings for their own profit. You dehumanize exactly. yourselves. So anytime people say that enslaved people were dehumanized, I always interrupt that. Absolutely not. Enslaved yeah. people were not dehumanized. Slave owners were dehumanized. Exactly. Wow. Well, exactly. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, Hillary, I I would really like you to come in because we could go on for days. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> yeah, I mean, um, I'm so having I'm so ha I'm having so much fun with this. You know, this is, this is really awesome. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I can relate to so much of what you're saying around the weight as a white person that I've carried around. And, yeah. um, you know, I felt it, it was, t it was totally paralyzing for a lot of my life. And, and yeah. I actually, in my supervision meeting with my, um, my boss at, at the hospital, so I'm a hospital chaplain in New York City. Hartford and um, my supervisor is a, a black Haitian man um, who's lived in the U.S. for a long time, but he didn't grow up here. And he has been doing this work as a chaplain for 30 years or something like that. Um, so he's an elder in every sense of the word. And he held space for me to talk about how I, my experience of going to a church um, that was in downtown Detroit, where it was half black and half white, and most of the white folks were from the suburbs, and the black folks were from that neighborhood or close by. And I remember, and I, I did this um, Facebook post, so people might know the story already, but I remember seeing the black kids singing and dancing and having a great time, and I was like, I want to go and play with them. And I like was like, wait, why, why do I feel like I can't? Like, what's going on? Like, the white kids are over there. Like, we drive from where we live to be here. So I'm supposed to relate to them. And I kind of do, but not really, actually. And then I can't really relate with the black kids either. And like, but like, <laughs> I want to play and sing and dance. But like, something in me was scared, like terrified to do that. And was it because of their color? Was it because of my color? Like, I don't know if that was it. I think it had more to do with my in, in own internalized trauma um, right. for many, many reasons, not just because of racism, but I think because I shut myself down at a young age and didn't feel free to express myself and to be alive. And I could also see that like, socially there was this divide and it just perpetuated itself and no one was addressing it at all mm -hmm. um, and so nothing was going to change and the same thing happened at the all-girls catholic high school that i went to where it was about 30 percent black and i wanted to go hang out in the back of the cafeteria with the black girls and <laughs> dance you know but like I would go back there sometimes just to be like, see what would happen. And they would totally ignore me. They wouldn't even look at me. I'd be like, hi. And they'd be like, you don't exist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> because we probably did that to them. You know, they, you look, you look like people that could hurt them. Well, yeah. <laughs> like, totally. like, I like, I'm like, I tell Hillary this all the time now and it's crazy. Like, like there was a time when I really looked at all the white women I worked with. I'm like, you guys are so like scary. Like I had anxiety going into work. Like I, I could not, I could not believe how like mean spirited these white women were being towards me. It's crazy. Yeah. Um, but I had to make sure that I didn't treat Hillary like the white women I work with. Right. Like that's not okay. I can't bring the past with me and then fling it on Hillary. Yeah. <laughs> I yeah. probably wouldn't miss you anyways, but it's okay. <laughs> but no. Yeah, I mean, and so I knew these. I knew these dynamics were there growing up, and I didn't see anyone addressing it, and I didn't know what to do about that. I just felt it, and I felt this, this like I should do something, but what can I do, or what do I say? And even helping to start nonprofits or do anti-oppression work, and I just felt my heart like closing down more and more and more, and being afraid because I'm supposed to do something or I'm supposed to acknowledge these things or understand the definitions or be the right person and do it the right way. And that's whiteness. Mm. Like, that was shutting me down because I should, I'm not good enough or I don't know, or I'm going to do something wrong and I'm, you know, I'm going to hurt someone. Right. And so what helped me through that was actually being my wild self was, doing what I wanted to do was singing and dancing and expressing <laughs> and feeling and screaming and rolling around on the ground and like being the wildness that my ancestors were afraid to express and shut down. And, you know, 
And maybe some of us are reminded of that by seeing other people do that, who remind them of the whiteness. And, and I think that indigenous people and people of color are more connected in many ways and have been because some of them have, have held those cultures and have shared them and have protected those cultures that still have that wildness intact. Um, so, you know, a lot of m my journey has been to uh, get back to that and get back to the land and then realize, oh, what is the story? What are the stories that my ancestry, like I'm carrying in myself from my ancestry around whiteness and blackness and, and that my grandfather was probably killed by a Jamaican man and that that like created this trauma and this fear that was unspoken and just total shutdown. Yeah. So I woke that up and I woke up my relationship to him and doing the forgiveness work with him and honoring his life because he was probably super in the world war two, he was in charge of all these Jamaican men and he had death threats against him. And it wasn't his decision to say what he said to these black men, but he had to do it, you know, to make money and protect his children and so forth. So he was in this odd position, but no one was acknowledging any of that at all. Mm -hmm. And so as a result, I could feel the rage and the anger and I could let it through and I could open up my channels to say, okay, I can do things differently and I can have these conversations and I can be my more wild, open self with people. And I can allow myself to feel with others and for us to heal together. Yeah. So that's, you know, the inspiration for doing this kind of work. And I didn't know how to do it, you know, and I wasn't going to do it alone. <laughs> and so I'm so grateful that you can, like, was the answer to my prayer of being like, what do I do with this awareness? Yeah. How do I share this? Because yeah. the white people around me didn't want to hear it either necessarily, right. you know, like they don't want to talk about racism because they're going to feel those feelings too that I was feeling, right? Like this is and when they, and I think that we, we do a disservice. We don't define racism the right way, right? Like yeah. a lot of white people think racism means I want black people to die, <laughs> you know, or like, I hate black people. That's not racism. No. Like yeah. racism is policies and laws and institutions in this country that were designed to keep certain people out and give other people a easier access. That's it. You know, like you talk about the GI Bill, right? Like black GIs coming back and not being able to get that college degree and not being able to get that 0% interest mortgage, you know, and a college degree and a house in 1950, that was the beginning of you were about to be it. You were about to make it, right? Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. And they just, they were X'd out of that whole, like, you know, and for me, like, I, like you agreed, it's like capitalism and racism are like bedmates, right? Like, they're just like, they go hand in hand. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so that's, and it was interesting because at, when I had a lot of money, right, when I had all the life insurance money, that was the most protected I was from racism. Mm -hmm. right? yeah. And so, uh, but if I was a darker skinned woman, walking out in these streets it doesn't matter they don't know if i have a black american express card in my wallet right the assumption is what the assumption is about black women right right it wouldn't be like oh she probably has a lot of money and she's here to spend money no <laughs> hmm. um we just have to fight yep. those programs you know like i do an exercise with my students i say raise your hand if you know a real live black man if he comes to your house for birthday parties, for Thanksgiving, like a real black man friend who comes to your house, no kid at this school raises their hand because they don't know them. Mm -hmm. Then I say, okay, raise your hand if you know what black men are like. All these hands go up. Well, how the hell? How the hell do you know what a black man is like? You just told me you don't have any black men in your life. That's the power of the media. Is that it? That's the, it's the quickest exercise. And they all go, oh, you know? And then just don't believe everything you think. Yeah, because we are very influenced by the We're media. We're so programmed. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Like, even little kids, you watch how we socialize children. Children recognize other human beings and say hello to them until we tell them, stop, don't talk to that one. That's a stranger. Right? Mm -hmm. Dogs don't walk by each other without acknowledging each other. Cats don't walk by each other. Well, cats might. But, you know, like <laughs> animals, 
where <laughs> animals acknowledge each other. Human beings will be in an elevator next to each other and not speak. Human mm -hmm. beings will walk by each other in a hallway and not even make eye contact, you know? Little kids don't do that. They're taught to do that. We are taught division and separation. Exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, I have a brief question for you, too. I'm curious about the Race and Equity Center. And oh, yeah. Because I was doing this very short training today uh, at the hospital around, it was called Beyond Diversity, and was talking about, like, our um, internalized... Um, racism and and I want to know like how do you do it how do how do you do these trainings um, and and create it uh, to, to be engaged it depends on the organization that's calling to request the training right mm -hmm. so if it's a school they have a pre-meeting with the school and find out what they want the group I'm doing right now is that um, for incoming freshmen at a, a a Catholic university that recently let men into the school three years ago. And they had an incident recently where <laughs> had on a, a face charcoal mask. Um, so what we're doing there is just, we're raising consciousness and creating shared language. Like it's such basic stuff that we could be teaching in third grade, but we all have to teach. We have to teach everybody what, what does, what is racism? What is power? What is privilege? What is systemic racism? What is interpersonal racism? What is So we're just giving them shared language. Um, the training we did yesterday was a bean game that exposes how the game is set up with unfair rules. Not everybody has the same amount when you start. Um, so to answer your question, the Race and Equity Center really wants to raise consciousness, create shared language to begin dismantling systemic racism. Okay. Um, Beyond diversity, that's good because we should be beyond diversity at this point. We're talking; <laughs> it should be about sure. equity, 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 equity. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, well, I hope to experience it someday soon. You should train to be a per diem facilitator. Yeah, I want to. I okay, will. I'll definitely keep you in the loop. A hundred percent. You'd be great at it. Oh, yeah. thanks. for real. <laughs> Well, I see that Prakash has had a hand up for a really long time. Hi, Prakash! I'd love to hear his question. Can I unmute him? Ooh. Hold on, Prakash, you're on mute. I know, I'm trying to get him unmuted, but it's not working. Yeah. Oh. I just pressed unmute. There you go. Hello. Hi. Hi. Okay, um, I'm in my... Hi. It's been wonderful hearing from you. I'm in my car, about to start driving to head to uh, Montague Retreat Center. Um, but I'd especially love to hear more about how you feel like you've changed in the last four or five months, and specifically about what what are the practices that you feel, you know, um, how are they working, helping you in your own transformation? Uh -huh. Like. Um, I'm interested in hearing more about like, so what's been happening with this, this change going on with you? So how, I, how is that? What's the things that are bring help supporting that in your life right now? For me, it is the morning and evening meditation. When I sit down and uh, I'm on lesson one of this meditation um, path, I have a mantra that I'm supposed to say. And the mantra that I have right now and my meditation absolutely reconnects me in the morning for 20 minutes and in the evening for 20 minutes with my consciousness with who i really am so in the morning doing that and then singing the kirtan uh singing the kirtan meditation is baba nam kevalam and that means um only feeling infinite love in sanskrit so chanting that for 15 minutes right only feeling infinite love only infinite love is real only feeling infinite love but in Sanskrit, Baba Nam Kevalam, chant that for 15 minutes, then meditate for 20 minutes. That grounds me in my identity and who I really am. Then I come out of meditation and I look in the mirror and I'm like, oh, so this time I'm this body. Okay, cool. I can very much associate with this part of me as temporary and the inner part of me as permanent and real. And then when I'm walking through the world, I'm this in observer self, the consciousness inside 
this body having the experiences so then I can have this grace, right? Of like, oh, you know, that person is a reflection of the messed up system. That person is not the problem. That person is actually a wonderful reminder that we have work to do a level up. That's how I see Trump. Trump is a flashlight and a mirror. He has, re he has reminded us and revealed to us that we still have work to do in this country. He's not the cause of it. He's not the reason we have hate crimes. He's not the reason we have racism. He's not encouraging it. He's not discouraging it. He's just exposing it. And thank goodness, because you couldn't even get these conversations off the ground when we had Obama in the office, because everybody was convinced America was, oh, you know, like we're post-racial, everything's great now. And we're like, mm, not really. Um, so I, that's how it helps me, Prakash. The most important part is the morning meditation, the evening meditation. And then secondarily, I'm not supposed to be wasting time anymore as part of this practice, right? So TV should be taking a back seat. And it has again, I'm reading again. So reading spiritual texts, reading um, things about quantum physics and the nature of reality, reading things about the universe. Like I am, I'm attaching to my true identity by morning and evening meditation. And then I'm detaching from the ideological um, racism and the opportunities to program my brain. I'm detaching from that. And then I'm feeding myself um, healthy fuel. Does that answer your question, Prakash? Yes, very much. <clears throat> and then are there are there tools? Being in community with a bunch of white margies, that's been very healing for me. Um, so Prakash, his wife is my meditation teacher. She's a white woman. Prakash is a white man. And I consider them family now, like dear, dear heart friends. Um, they adopted and raised four black girls. That was my first clue that I could be safe around them. <laughs> Oh no, Anne Marie's gone. Oh, she's back. <laughs> Don't know what happened there. Um, so yeah, that's it. The practice of attaching to my true identity, detaching from television and Instagram and Facebook and trying not to be on my phone or on TV as much. And if I do watch TV now, I only watch Star Trek <laughs> <and> Generation. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I like the future that they show in Star Trek Next Generation. <laughs> <laughs> Ultra diversity. Yes. Yeah. But, I, but I'm really trying to just feed myself healthy, healthy content. Yeah. Mm. Nice. Yeah. And I had, my hair was really long, but I had started, I had relaxed it and put chemicals in it. And so I wanted to start fresh and grow my hair out naturally again and embrace that and be in love with that part of me. So chopping it all off, now it's growing in. I'm aware of the socialization of what is considered pretty. I'm like, ugh, I look terrible. But I know I'm only saying that because of how I've been indoctrinated to think of what beauty is. So I'm beautiful, period. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Cause I say so. <laughs> I, do you have a question? Um, well, I don't really have a question. Just more, I'm just soaking this all in. I'm just really um, tremendously grateful, um, Chastity. Thank you so much for all your sharing. I really appreciate it. And. Um, my my heart was touched well many times when you spoke but um you know one example is when when you spoke about your son and fearing for his safety and i really um related i'm also i'm a mother of a, a teenage daughter um but i i you know i relate mother to mother i have feared for my daughter's safety not because of you know she's white not that she would be a target of racism although i i uh, you know, I, but I, I, um, you know, I have, I don't know if you can see over there, there's a painting on the wall. Oh, I definitely saw that when we were, yeah, when it's it. yeah. uh, by a Haitian artist named Claude Danville. Dan, Dan anyway, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a black mother nursing her child. And I 
have that there as a reminder to me um, that what, you know, what, you know, the feelings that all parents That's right. have for their, their children and just to, to hold on to that. That and I can imagine how scary it would be to be raising a a white daughter in this world right now. Like, well, yeah, I I I'd don't... probably be policing her outfits. You know, like is that well, what you're gonna wear? Are you gonna wear it? Like, yeah, I worry about her getting raped. Absolutely, absolutely, I worry about that. I worry well, about I that. About but I also know that if she were black and female, I'd be worrying even more yeah you know so i i get that but i yeah i you know but anyway so I, that touched me when you were and also i was very uh i was moved when you were talking about um schools and i i worked long ago i worked at the um cambridge friends school and i was very fortunate um at that time because it was many it was in the 80s but we were the the first school in the nation the independent school in the nation that we we put anti-racism in our mission statement wow <laughs> and that is huge it is huge it is huge and not only that but the entire school and when i say entire school i mean the faculty the administration the parents the kids the staff i mean every everybody went through intensive anti-racism training and that makes sense because the quakers were like the original abolitionists absolutely absolutely so we all went and it was life-changing awesome. for me life-changing for me personally and for the community i mean it was just i watched it at this time of transformation and i'll i'll tell you in a second about what i observed in the classroom but just for me personally it just set me on this journey that I now see as a lifelong journey. You know, I will be working on my own racism for my entire life because I know it just goes that that deep. Yeah. Um, but I I feel so grateful that I had that um, you know, oh so for, impressive. That, yeah. It was really I was very fortunate that I was there at that time. But anyway, getting back to the the classroom experience, you know, I taught a combined class of first and second graders. Hmm. So I saw I had them for two years yeah. and it was fascinating to me because it was right at this time that we went through all this intensive training and the school made all these really big changes on an institutional level that, and it changed the, um, it changed the, we had more kids coming in the second year yeah. who we had more kids of color the second year than we did the first because we had some kids that white kids let left we had some kids of color come in so the percentages changed and my awareness i was less racist than i was you know going in yeah the whole environment was just more supportive and the, everything and i watched these kids the kids i i watched well i watched change on both sides from both the the dark-skinned kids and the lighter-skinned kids but among the kids of color like you know, the first year there was a lot of hiding behaviors or crying, acting out, and you know, over and over, you know, you'd see it would be the black boys and the timeout and stuff. Yep. And um, that changed. I watched some some of the very same kids. That's awesome. The second year just blossom. Just just blossom. Because, because the kids in their power. Their central nervous system is attuning to the adult central nervous system in the room. So yeah. as an adult becomes more comfortable teaching a bunch of little black kids, the black kids will thrive. As the yeah. white person in the front of the room is aware to what their projections are, they will less project onto them, right? And then the kids can just be who they are. Black children suffer, suffer microaggressions from pre-K through 12th grade in schools. It is so exhausting for them. My yeah. heart aches for them. Yeah, no, and I, I see. Really, I, and at this point, I'm like, just homeschool your black children until they're ten. Yeah, like, well, well, yeah, and cool. also, I mean, I that's not the answer, but but I but I know families. I have a I, I homeschooled my daughter for many years, mm -hmm. um, and but I and so in the homeschooling community, like I know a family, a black black family, African American family, who had three sons, have three sons, and they have homeschooled those sons all the way through school, and those sons are. And they travel the world and they've just and they didn't those boys didn't eat up the program so exactly they and they are very 
confident in, yeah. their, you know, in their power. Um, I'm telling you. Men. And, uh, but I've homeschooled my daughter in part because I didn't want her to have all the, also the institutionalized, you know, Misogyny. education of being the oppressor and, yeah. and absorbing all that, oh. uh, you know, the, the, the racial bias and the everything. So it's, yep. uh, but it's, yeah, anyway, yeah. I just think, I, I, I just want to say, I, I, I heard you on that. I mean, I've seen too many black boys sitting in timeout in schools that I have visited and it breaks my heart to see yeah. it. Yeah, our it's schools, cool. our, our school, um, it's insane. Like the, the detentions, um, <laughs> the higher up you get into the APs, like the less, like it's like, oh, where did all the black kids go? You know? Yeah, um, yeah. And so that's, that's an equity issue. That's an issue with the school. Like we have to make sure that the schools know that it's a systemic problem and not an individual problem. You know, yeah. like to target the kid and be like, well, he may not be a good fit here. Or maybe it's like, no, maybe it's your culturally incompetent staff. Mm, that is yeah. Like making these kids feel unnecessarily boxed in to a stereotype. Like yeah. my son, when he left that school and he went to our local neighborhood school, which is not awesome. They don't have enough textbooks. They don't have uh, computers, like enough computers, but all the kids are black. And so Noah came home. I remember he was like, mom, there's black nerds. There's black athletes. There's black musicians. There's black cool kids. There's black, like black kids got to have the full spectrum of being. <laughs> Whereas at the private school he left, there were two kinds of kids. Two, you had two stereotypes you could be if you were a black kid there. One, super, super smart or super, super athletic. And that was it. Those are your two options. And so he just wanted to have a place where he, his, his, his identity could develop bigger sure. than this limited that the school, the white school was giving him. Yeah, yeah. So for parents of color, right, we have the choice between a local school that has a lot of kids that look like our babies, but are shitty, right, right. or spend a lot of money or hope for a scholarship and put them in a school that has a lot of resources, but they are wounded by people's racial incompetence and microaggressions and their racial identity gets negatively impacted. This is a shitty choice. It is. Yeah. Come here. Yeah. Boy, this little man. Or homeschool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, wow. Wow. This conversation is so incredibly rich and full and I'm so grateful. I'm so I was like, I'm like, what am I going to say? <laughs> uh, didn't think there was any worries about that. <laughs> um, and it is almost eight o'clock. So, and if there's anything that you want to say, Chastity, to wrap up. Um, I want to thank you and Anne for having this forum. Um, I think that the internet can be used for so much good and so much um, dismantling, like we get to decide the programming, right? And I'm happy to know this exists. I think there should be way more like this. Um, I also think, I love you Prakash, women are gonna save this world. <laughs> um, I think us coming together, like I always say, and like, I, you know, like when black women and white women heal their relationship, the world is gonna, like, that's the beginning of the solution, I believe. Um, that was my phone, sorry. So I just wanna say thank you and how inspiring this really was. And then just a quick question. This is gonna be, you said posted somewhere live. Did I say anything disparaging about the place where I work? You didn't say the name of it and- <laughs> Oh, okay, good. <laughs> yeah, and I don't think so. It's gonna yeah. be on Facebook. So we're gonna yeah. post it on Race Between Races. How many people usually <laughs> see these? Um. I, it depends, you know, like okay. the last few, we've had like 30 views, but some this of is them my, this, so this is my, inter like, I'm afraid that I'm going to be in trouble for speaking out about the place where I work. And if people see me and they're like, oh, I know her, I know where she works. And she's talking, I don't know. That's, that's internal. You see that? That's my fear. Yeah. Well, we can talk about that too. Um, and I can choose not to put it, we can choose not to put it on our Facebook pages. We can, you know, on our personal pages. Um, we have said that we would post all of the recordings on Grace Between Races. Yeah. 
and they're Actually, you know what i don't want to let fear win i don't want to move from fear i don't i stand by what i said you know like it is what it is so i'm happy it's fine okay <laughs> I got a little nervous okay well thank you for I, I didn't say the school right no <laughs> no but you know i think that what you said was really true it is true and 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 i've said it to the dean of students face and i've said it to the headmaster's face so yeah okay. so you know yeah. bit by bit that truth comes out right right on right on yeah for sure yeah, yeah and um i'm looking forward to our continued conversation and engagement around these themes and see where it goes from here and so thank you carrie again for bringing their question and and engaging so deeply with us. Yeah, and I, I wanted to know, so Carrie, I, I hope it was very fortunate to be here. And thank you, Chastity yeah. and Hillary and Anne, all, all of you. And, and, uh, and, and what, what was the name of the, the other, the man who was here? Who's your friend? Um, oh, Prakash. Prakash. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. And I want you to know, thank you for sharing your feelings about, um, spirituality and like, and your talk and earlier about, you know, spirit, keeping the word spirituality in the, um, name and all. Um, I think religion is the opposite of spirituality. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but I, I'm, I don't, I, I think I don't identify as spiritual either. Um, I don't identify as spiritual or religious. I am secular and I, but I think that I loved when Anne shared like the values of like peace and oneness and yes, yeah. and, um, oh, I'm suddenly spacing on the fourth one, but anyway, I, like I embrace those values and I think that there are wonderful religious organizations, spiritual organizations and secular organizations that also share those values. And, you know, the key is to, to be allies and, and work together and, you know, uh, with a shared vision. And, um, so I, I'm not here to change and make this not spiritual. I'm not that well, way I wanted at all. to make sure that my talk landed with you and didn't offend you or didn't touch you. No, me. I didn't. The, it, everything was fine. The only thing that did was when you went like this to me, I felt a little like it's a prayer thing and I'm a little like, ah, I don't do that. <laughs> Other than that, <laughs> like, you know, I, I really have gratitude. But I also, like I said, but I don't, uh, that because it was more to me, you know, like to me and I, I'm not that but I don't want, I think the group is, you know, the group could, it's a spiritual group and it's okay. I'm, I'm here, as I said, as a guest, not a member, I'm not expecting it not to be spiritual. It should be as spiritual as, as, you know, you, the, the members and facilitators want it to be. I, you know, that's, I, I'm not here to derail that in any way, mm. but, but it's also very, I have to say it, Part of the way I have entered and empathized with uh, being oppressed. No, I'm not racially oppressed in the same way that someone with dark skin is. I mean, I'm not, I mean, I'm, you know, but in, I don't have, I have racial privilege, but as an atheist, there is oppression. Mm -hmm. And that has been an inroad for me. Yeah in understanding other forms of oppression right on. and so um i don't uh, I, i'm a anyway i'm just i'm appreciative that in this form i'm able to be who i am and share my truth and i'm not trying to change you all but i appreciate and i thank you and i um you know and i'm and i share the goal of of racial reconcil reconciliation and right on. racial justice and that's good the moralists, so. all the moralists. You know. <laughs> you know, so. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. Just want to share, Carrie, that you know I studied to be a, a Unitarian Universalist minister, and uh -huh. there's a lot of atheists in Unitarian Universalist churches. Yes, yes, yeah. yeah. I might check out the UU Church someday because I think I might feel welcome there. And and um, yeah, that's thank you. I I do aspire to to welcome atheists. Yes, yes. So I really appreciate you speaking that and speaking your truth so that we can welcome you really. more. Yeah, well, I think it, I also did want to make the point because I have known over, you know, I have known and continue to know um, 
you know, black, uh, you know, BIPOC, you know, people who are also, um, do also do not identify as spiritual or who are, you know, atheists and so on. And so I just, in the interest of intersectionality, I also just kind of like, I don't want to speak for them, but I also just kind of like, there's a certain way in which I, I like, I like to provide those websites or whatever. So that, oh, what's that? um, uh just we can always keep keep that the 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 full diversity within you know like you were saying it's like for your son like yeah not all black boys so there's always it's not a monolith there's like many a broad range of experiences in their own big range yes. <laughs> and yes there are even you know uh Black atheists, and even I haven't really, I've only ever met one indigenous person who did not identify as spiritual, but I did meet one who did. Oh my gosh, that's amazing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so um, anyway, thank you again. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks for receiving me, all. And, and I also want to mention that we are still doing a fundraiser for Anne to make it possible for her to fix her computer so that she can be more fully engaged in the administration and we've had a lot of communication issues even today um so we're gonna put that link again awesome. on grace between races and awesome. please do support us to continue this work um we are doing at least one gathering a month continuing since i'm working full time and we and doesn't have a computer yet so it's it's been a lot to be like, okay, how are we holding this now? And we want to continue holding it. So anyone out there who wants to join in with us and uh, do a little bit more of the, the lifting with us, the kind of uplifting, <laughs> we'd love to have you join. So yeah. Anything Absolutely. you want to Absolutely. Thank you guys. Thank you all. Um, chastity that was so special what you just shared with us and Carrie you also um, so happy to have you here and glad to hear that you feel um, welcome yeah because this is the intention is to to be all inclusive and so um, yeah um, it would be nice to have my computer up and running as Hillary mentioned and so if anybody outside there um, resonate with this kind of um, message and gathering and would like the support um, would gladly you know um, be open to receive yeah. um, anything special before we leave um, I just want to say that um, you know my 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 um, my mission is to really keep bringing us back to the importance of, of uh, really going within ourselves, wherever our, uh, your journey is outside there, bring it back to the self, see yourself through the eyes of source, mm -hmm. sit work because hmm. Come back to us, Anne. Uh, nice freeze face. Yeah, not bad. <laughs> Stances outside. Yes, we can make changes by standing up and speaking out, but the, the real change is really within the self. And that, that power, because even if you go and you change something outside and there's nothing inside within yourself that you, uh, you, 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 you have, um, then the, the work is not, it's not the real core work. The yeah. core work is become master my self mastery this is what i'm aiming at and self mastery then you are guided and lead, led in the right direction and to take the right uh, approach in whichever direction that is so center groundedness i mean i'm a work in progress um um i'm, I'm nowhere near um perfection perfection or you know anything like that i'm a mom i'm a single mom Oh, no. I have come in contact with stuff that, that worked for me and really brought me to my, my strength, my true sense of uh, power. And um, 
that's available for all of us. Mm -hmm. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being here, for sharing with us. And please excuse my tech, technology um, uh, <laughs> weirdness, jumping in and out. Um, so yeah, so thank you guys and thank have a wonderful, all. wonderful night. Thanks, yeah, Chastity. Right. You're awesome. Right. Keep thank on you. doing what you're doing. Love, love, love. <laughs> Thank you, Carrie. <laughs> and Hillary. <laughs> Thank you, Hillary. <laughs> <Bye. laughs>